Let's pull this bandaid off. <laughs> uh, can I have a Kleenex yeah. just to hang yeah. out? Thanks. You can leave it there. Because uh, there's going to be tears. Oh, don't cry, Lance. Don't cry for me, Henry Hackle. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare yourself for the terror. The prison of madness where few enter and none return. Welcome to Unsung Horrors. With Lance. <laughs> and Erica. Leave all your sanity behind. It can't help you now. Welcome to another episode of Unsung Horrors, the podcast where we discuss underseen horror films, specifically those with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. I'm Lance. And I'm Erica. And for this episode, Mm. we are going to be talking about Oliver Reed. Yes, that's it. (laughs) That's it. We're only talking about Oliver Reed. We're not... You know, we're not talking about a move one particular move. Eh, never mind. <laughs> Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype, which stars the fantastic, always captivating Oliver Reed. Eric, I know you watched a ton of his films. Yes. These past few weeks, probably to delay you having to watch. Very Dr. much so. <laughs> yes. I did too. I mean, I hope we do spend time discussing the film, but we'll spend, you know, a lot of time. Majority discussing. of this episode, thankfully, will be about Oliver Reed. Come and- on now. I, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, that was one of the main picks. I yeah. mean, my main reason why I select this movie. And I, and I appreciate you for that. And, I, and this, I'm was, gonna... this was a pick for you. Thank you. I... Oh, like, okay. Yeah, Thank you, you. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I was like, oh my gosh, she almost said it. She said it. Okay. But I, I will say this much. I, I do not hate this movie with the fire of a thousand th- sons like I did. Blood, Blood sucking, sucking pharaohs, pharaohs in, in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Blood fucking par- whatever it is. I don't <laughs> Fuck that movie. I hate it so much. I did not hate this movie. It is tedious. Yeah. It's way, way too long. Oliver Reed is not funny. He is. No. Oh my God. Not on purpose. Like, I mean, he's not comedic. Oh, well, well, okay. Well, okay. I saw a lot of the movies that you watched of his. And I watched because I hadn't I haven't seen him in a lot of comedic roles. Yeah. Other, this was like mainly the first one. Uh huh. So I watched a lot of his comedies, and oh. he is a funny man. Mm, okay, maybe because he's so because you know him as a serious you know Hellraiser actor. Yeah, and like what the hell is he doing with this terrible voice? You know, you know I'm trying to be funny. He's tr- That's the thing is like he's trying to be funny like. John pointed me to this uh, appearance he did on David Letterman, where he's just doing all of these impressions, and oh. it's it's painful to watch. Like I was I, he drunk. I, <laughs> <laughs> he was <already> drunk. <laughs> Our first guest tonight is uh, one of the most well-known tough guys in England. He's acted in more than sixty films in the last thirty years, and he's the only guest uh, we've ever had that can drink Lee Marvin under the table. <laughs> Currently in a new motion picture entitled Castaway, folks, please welcome Oliver Reed. How you doing? Well, I'm trying to look like Slim. <laughs> trying to look like Slim. Yeah, I'm going to take that uh, Rambo out of his uh-huh. stand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> whatever, whatever you want. That's yeah. fine with me. Uh, I understand it goes boom, boom. I understand I've just been outside in the green room. I've seen all these fellas, you know, wrapping them gooks on the head, man. Uh-huh. I'm going to take that Rambo home. Okay. Do something real mean to him. It's uh, incidentally, incidentally, somebody. I'm sorry. You want to say something? I was trying to do up my shirt uh-huh. just now, and the button came I off. See. I hope I'm not no, making right. myself too uncomfortable here. It's uh, it's fun to pretend, isn't it? It's great fun. <laughs> I thought you was terribly serious. I heard this was an intellectual show. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. I, I, I was, I loved his character, especially the inner dialogue of his character. I think it's funny. I think, I don't know. I, I know All right. different strokes for different folks. That, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. First we're, we're going to jump into all okay, of Heckle and Hype yeah. from 1980. It's about a podiatrist. I'm not going to get too much into this. It's not a deep movie or anything. With no. Plot. 
Okay, a podiatrist, Dr. Henry Heckel, who he hates his life. He's an ugly fellow, sort of a goblin or orc looking man. What would you say is his malady? Like, is he a leper? Is he just he, ugly? He looks like he had leprosy. No, he looks like, um, because he's got like these, these perfectly manicured green nails. Like, yeah. those are the nails. Like, if I had long nails, I would never. But if I did, yeah. I was like, man, those look, he's got great nails. I go to nails. the salon every day, paint yeah. them up. Yeah. Um, but his face, you know, he, it's just sort of like disfigured and, and warty and uh, greenish color, yeah. like puke colored. So terrible wig. I get they yeah. say numerous times that his nose looks like a half eaten carrot. Sure. Yeah. Uh, he has different contacts. I mean, you know me, everybody. I think it's I think it's really cool to look at. I just I, I, I it's, it's a bad, you know, spirit of Halloween. It is makeup job like it is. <laughs> uh anyways so henry heckle he's very unhappy he's alone he decides he's planning to kill himself and during this time he's been kind of stalking a woman at the bus stop coral yeah and so his intention is to commit suicide by chopping his own head off with these large garden shears think the burning folks it's like that. exactly <laughs> yeah there's a scene that's right right between his is he's ready to do it yeah uh, but one of his colleagues, Dr. Hinkle, has created a potion, or they call it a diet paste, that makes overweight patients thin. But Hinkle warns Heckle that too much would kill a horse and cause one to maybe turn into kidneys and disappear. There's going to be a call back to that. Yes. Uh, Heckle chugs the paste, hoping to die, and he turns into the sexy suave Mr. Hype, also known as Oliver Reed. But uh, although Hype is handsome, he's also a very violent, angry man. So he begins killing women, specifically when they won't tell him how beautiful and handsome he is. Uh, Hype tells the staff at the medical clinic that he's Heckle's cousin, and he takes over Heckle's practice and his patients. And Coral, the woman that Heckle has kind of been infatuated with, she comes in for a foot check, and she's completely turned off by Hype, but seems to like Heckle. And the ending isn't really worth mentioning, but we'll talk about it. Yeah. So as of this recording, Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype has 353 views on Letterboxd. It's free to watch on YouTube. There is a Scorpion releasing Blu-ray out there for anybody that wants to, to buy it. No one's going to buy this. Yeah. Uh, okay, we don't cover a whole lot of horror comedies, mm -hmm. you know, for obviously good reasons. Most of them don't land. But there are some bangers out there. I mean, Return of the Living Dead. Yeah, uh, Reanimator. Yeah, Peter Jackson's Brain Dead. Yeah. We already said blood sucking froze in Pittsburgh. No. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but when you decide to do a horror comedy spoof on classic literature, it's it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. And it's tough to pull off. You know, Mel Brooks is kind of the king of spoofs with his young Frankenstein. It's pronounced Frankenstein. Dracula dead and loving it with Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Charles B. Griffith, the director of, of Heckle and Hype, he had an idea to write a film called Dr. Feelgood and Mr. Hype, which was about a hippie who invents a new drug that turns everyone into these corporate advertising executives. And he pitched uh, this idea to Canon Films powerhouse producers, uh, Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus. And they agreed to the idea, but Golan wanted the ugly guy to be the good guy and the handsome one to be the evil one. So kind of a flip on Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. And this is kind of how Heckle and Hype was born. Griffith wrote the script and prepared for shooting, casting, uh, just in a short three-week three, three week period. Apparently, the script was like 200 pages. Jesus. <laughs> I know. Uh, Roger And Roger Corman has an uncredited writing credit. I guess he, him and Griffith have a long working relationship up to this point. Yeah. Yeah. Griffith started his writing career in the early twenties. He met when he met Corman who hired him to write some early Westerns that he was planning to film. Um, but his first writing credit was for Roger Corman's the gunslinger in 1956. And then he went on to write like two dozen other Corman directed and produced films, including attack of the crab monsters. It conquered the earth creature from the haunted sea, the undead, the wild angels, uh, just a ton of like AIP and new world picture films. But his most well-known screenplays that he wrote with and for Corman are A Bucket of Blood from 1959, mm -hmm. Dick Miller, starring Dick Miller, uh, The Little Shop of Horrors from 1960, uh, and Death Race 2000, directed mm -hmm. by Mary Warnoff's movie husband, Paul Bartell. So he Griffith really helped AIP and Corman production kind of get on the map with these 
with these films, these really fun films that he wrote that ended up having, you know, these cult followings. But, and of course, with just about every writer that works with Corman, Griffith was given the opportunity to start directing. He only has six directing credits. Uh, his first was with uh, Columbia Pictures uh, in 1959 called Forbidden Island, which he also wrote. I watched this. It's like just over an hour long. Mm-hmm. It's a decent little like crime adventure. Okay. Um, guys go searching for an emerald from a sunken ship. A lot of double crossing, backstabbing, uh, actually a high body count, which was kind of surprising. Yeah. Okay. So it was fine. And then he, you know, started going into the Corman produced stuff. He then wrote and directed Eat My Dust from 1976. Don't you hate this movie? I do. Yeah. This is what this was my June exploitation pick for yeah, cars, cars. Like a few years ago. Yeah, there. like in 2020. Um, I didn't like it. It didn't land. Like none of the jokes really landed for me, which probably every Griffith movie might be. He made this, I mean, what made Eat My Dust relevant was because it stars a young Ron Howard who wanted to start directing in his career. And Corman's like, hey, I'll finance your next film if you star in this yeah. Charles B. Griffith banger called Eat My Dust. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, then in 1979, Griffith directed the uh, Jaws ripoff, Up From the Depths, which I watched for this year's June exploitation ripoff category. And it's terrible. <laughs> Um, I'll say my thoughts for our June exploitation. Okay. Episode, okay. Uh, if anyone wants to listen to that in a few weeks, uh, then he directed heckle and hype in 1980 and in 81, he directed another ripoff of sorts called Smokey bites the dust. And Jimmy McNichol is the lead. He's the main kid, Billy Lynch from uh, butcher Baker nightmare maker. Oh, okay. And he's, you know, he's pretty funny. Uh, he plays a high school kid named Roscoe who steals a car and he pretty much kidnaps the prom queen to kind of impress her. Um, William Forsyth plays the high school quarterback, but it, it, it's just like a long car chase with everybody in town after the kid. Hmm. It's exactly the same script as Eat My Dust. Okay. It, it, it's obviously more cocaine was involved though. It, we're, oh, it's about five years later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually enjoyed this one. Uh, I thought it was funny. There's a lot of character actors pop up. Dick Miller's in it. He's very angry, yelling a lot. Okay. But again, it's like comparing Eat My Dust and Smokey Bite or Eat My Dust and Smokey Bites the Dust. It's like comparing. Two rotten apples. <laughs> uh, and then his last uh, directing credit is Wizards of the Lost Kingdom 2, which is the only Griffith film I haven't watched. I've watched all all other five. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a sword and sorcery sequel from what I read in name only. It reuses a ton of footage, includes, including entire battle scenes from other Corman films. Uh, Barbarian Queen, Deathstalker, The Warrior, and The Sorceress. So it basically sounds like it's a directing credit for just reusing and redubbing yeah. um, for Griffith. Yeah, Griffith, obviously, he had original ideas, but which he turned into screenplays. But it seems like his forte seems to be recycled either his existing ideas or uh, ex- you know I- existing ideas from somebody else, which makes him a perfect fit to write a stupid movie like Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype. To me, a lot of his work is basically a Mad Magazine approach of like writing a comic strip. Like all the existing ideas are there. Mm-hmm. Visually, I think it looks like I'm reading a Mad Magazine too. I mean, the, the it's even got a little EC Comics going on with like the lighting and some of the scenes, especially especially throughout the city and stuff. Yeah, like the, well, at the end when it's like that, like pink and kind of green lighting going yeah. on, I was like, this looks like a creep show. Yeah, there's some there's some cool elements like. It, I'm not going to say, well, I, I can say he's, he's not a great director uh, no. by any means at all, but he has a silly cast and crew, like in every movie he's in. Yeah. And the crew's usually str- strong, which, you know, I'm going to get into. Um, a lot of people went on to work on tons of Corman films and other great movies, but yeah, I mean, I don't think, I don't think we need to get into Roger Corman's career. You know, we know. We talked a lot about it. We've we've been on uh, Anthony's Cult Movies podcast twice talking about Corman movies. Yes. So if you want to hear us talk more about Corman, you can listen to the Rock and Roll High School episode or Little Shop of Horrors episode. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the Corman and Griffith relationship seemed a perfect co- collaboration, too. I just yeah. Yeah, I want to point that out. But Heckle and Hype isn't a New World Pictures produced film. It's a Canon Group production. And, you know, we're not going to spend time on, on Golan and Globus and Canon Films Everybody knows what Cannon Group right. is. Electric Boogaloo, the wild untold story of the Cannon. Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great document. If nobody, if some, if none of our listeners have watched it, it's fantastic. But uh, I will point out that this movie, Heckle and Hype, it was apparently made for very little 
with very little time. You don't say that, you know, not it's and little budget. So Canon didn't pop a whole lot of money and faith really into this. Griffin was given nine weeks to write, produce, plan, cast, film, and edit the movie. So that's kind of an accomplishment when you step back. Nine weeks to do this whole movie. Okay, I'll give it that. Start, you know, from day one to, you know, the last day of editing. Uh, It was a rush project. It obviously shows, which we'll talk about. Other crew members other than uh, Griffith uh, that I kind of just want to point out real quick. Makeup is by uh, Karen Kubek and Steve Neal. We've already talked about a lot of the, the, the makeup, you know, of Heckle. Or of yeah, I, Heckle. Oh yeah, I yeah. <laughs> well no, it's it is confusing because they flipped who should be who, even though the two faces of D- Doctor Jekyll. Yeah, I watched that and they did the same thing in that where like Doctor Jekyll in that one is like the ugly one. It's the nutty professor approach. Yeah, it's Buddy Love. Yeah, but yeah. it's so I get it, but at the same time I'm like it's not. I mean, to be fair, the the original source material and it's been. Ugh, 20 plus years since I've read Stevenson's story, but the, the story itself is not so much about appearance as it is like, you know, inner desires and, and like those deviant sort of things that you want to do, but you don't feel like you can. And so you have to take on this other personality in order to do that. But I think we always associate the evil with the ugly. And so it, it turns to be like, it turns out to be a little jarring, not just in this, but also in the two faces of Dr. Jekyll. Yeah. Which again, I think I pointed out that poster makes no sense. It doesn't. No. Cause it's both Jekyll. Yeah. <laughs> it's two faces of, well, I guess it's called, no, it's called two faces of Dr. Jekyll. I don't know. It is. Yeah. So maybe the poster does make sense. I, uh, anyways, I. <laughs> yeah, the makeup is not very good in heckle and hype. But they did, like Quebec, she did uh, makeup for Forbidden World, Galaxy of Terror, and Trancers with Tim Thomerson. Oh, your boy. Yeah, he's my boy. <laughs> he's also in uh, Smokey, is it Smokey Bites the Dust? Oh, no, he's in, uh, uh, no, okay, I, I did watch a heckle, a different uh, heckle and Hyde comedy, and he pops up. Okay. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Okay. I love Tim Thomerson. I just, I want him to pop up in everything. <laughs> uh, and then Steve Neal did this stuff for a bunch of Larry Cohen stuff, like the, the, the stuff he did the makeup for return of the swamp thing, which is the really good mm-hmm. makeup swamp thing puppet yeah. master. So, I mean, again, the, the crew involved in a lot of Griffiths movies are, are fun. Like John Carl Be- Beekler, He worked on the special effects, obviously he did from beyond hatchet, Tammy, the T-Rex. Um, he went on to actually direct his own Jekyll and Hyde with Tony Todd playing the part. Really? Yeah. I haven't heard about this one. Yeah. I, I have a list of actors that played Jekyll and Hyde. Cause I think, I would imagine actors would jump at the opportunity of playing a dual role like this, where you can just kind of play the nice guy and play the fucking yeah. asshole. Uh, and then real quick, editor Skip Schoolnick, uh, he co-edited my favorite Halloween, Halloween 2, Rick Rosenthal's, not Rob Zombie's. Wait, that's your favorite Halloween? That's my favorite Halloween. Uh, more so than the original and part three. Oh, uh, well, part three has kind of, uh, the more and more I watch part three every year, it, it kind of, it's very close between part three. I do love the original, but I have way more enjoyment. I'm way more entertained with part two and part three than the original. The original, I love it, but it drags. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Wow. It gets a little, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But part two, I think is probably my favorite. Isn't that odd? Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk about why Heckle and Hyde is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's go to the original score real quick. Richard Band. He's well known, of course, for all Charles your favorite Bands, full yeah. moon entertainment movies. Uh, Reanimator, Puppet Master, Castle Freak, From Beyond, Doll Man with Tim Thomerson. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine he's he's in a, a lot of listeners' letterboxed overall top composers list. Because he has a lot of movies. Yeah. He's, he does a lot of fucking scores. Who knows? Unless you neglect Full Moon Entertainment. Okay, here we go. Cast. Erica, you already thanked me for giving you a reason to watch all these Oliver Reed movies. Yeah, there's that. (laughs) Uh, I mean, let's not... I know we're going to spend a lot of time on him, but let's not like go through his full filmography movie by movie because you watched a lot. I did. Did you want to talk about some of the ones you recently watched? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I do want to like preface this. So prior to this... 
like previously watched movies from Oliver Reed. Here's right. here's my top five Oliver oh, Reed okay. movies. Okay, good. Um, and then I'll get into the new ones that I watched. So obviously The Devils. That's always going to be my number one Oliver Reed movie. 100%. Uh, quickly followed by The Brood. Uh, Women in Love. Uh, Ken Russell's Women in Love. Because you get to see Oliver Reed wrestle naked with another man. And it's fantastic. I have not seen that. I have the criterion. You, you may borrow it. Okay. Uh, Revolver. Him and Fabio Testi, sad Fabio. It's wonderful. And then out of left field, this uh, movie from 1989. Yes. And it is only because of Oliver Reed's performance in this. Uh, he is snorting coke, watching snuff films. He is <laughs> off the rails. He is snorting rails. Revolver, you're talking about Revolver for our- wait. No, The Revenger. Oh, The Revenger, I'm sorry. This is my number five. Yeah, so Revolver is like number, Revolver's number four. Okay. The Revenger 1989 is some obscure, like dumb action movie that we're like, oh, let's just watch this random movie because Oliver Reed's in it. And then it turns out he is deranged in this movie. And it's wonderful. Yes. Um, highly recommend The Revenger. So that's my top five Oliver Reed prior to going into this. And I watched eight new Oliver Reed new to me movies. So one that had been on my list for a long time to finally watch. And it's mainly because this has one of the greatest posters ever and that's spasms. It's got a man like wrapped up in a giant snake in, yeah. in the poster. It's fantastic. Uh, the poster is way better than the movie. Basically <laughs> the premise is that this giant snake bit Oliver Reed in the past. And now Oliver Reed has some psychic connection with it. It has a few moments of good gore, but fucking Peter Fonda's in this movie Ooh. and everyone knows how much I hate Peter Fonda. He ruins every movie he's in. Reed does battle the giant snake at the end, but I'd rather watch him wrestle naked with another man in women in love. So I just want to jump in and say one of my favorite Oliver Reed movies was yeah. one of my favorite of last year, which involves snakes, which was Vin is venom. Venom. Klaus yeah. Kinski. 100%. Yeah. That would have been number six. I had to put, I had to put, uh, the Revenger on there. Cause I needed to mention like the cocaine and the oh, snuff films. No, no, the brood, the brood's on there. Yeah. That was number two. Oh, you, you flew by. It. I did. I was, sorry. I was, I'm looking over at some notes. No, Venom is it. fantastic. Yeah. Um, and we, we, so we did actually post on Instagram. We're like, Hey, we got an Oliver Reed movie coming up. We're going to be watching a bunch of movies. And we asked like, what are, what are some of y'all's favorite Oliver Reed performances or underseen performances? And I have, uh, one on here that I did watch because of someone's recommendation. I'm going to get to that one last because it's okay. I watched one from a recommendation too. Which one did you watch? I watched B Girl. Oh, okay. The very young, you know, this was uh, he's 22 years old. Yeah. This is before his infamous scar. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, this one was good. It was about an architect who marries a young French woman on this business trip, brings her back to meet her daughter, who's very teenage angst, hanging out with her beatnik. Mm -hmm. You know, literally, there was I, somebody said like. What's the story, Daddy-O? You know? <laughs> uh, but apparently it's an inspiration for Edgar Wright's uh, Last Night in Soho. And he used some of the music from it, from the John Barry oh, Seven Orchestra. Okay. Uh, she goes into this, like, the seedy underworld of, of stripping, just, like, in spite of her father. Mm -hmm. She poses as her stepmother. It's real short. Oliver Reed, I think his credit was plaid shirt. Yeah. And uh, he's in a lot of scenes, but he's basically just kind of toe tapping and dancing in the background mm -hmm. and drinking. Yeah. Uh, he has a couple lines. Uh, who steals the show is Christopher Lee, who plays like this fucking nightclub guy who loves little girls, young yeah. girls. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess he's kind of like the Matt Smith character from Last Night in Soho. But yeah, no, it's very cool to see a young Oliver okay. Reed. Um, okay, I'll, I'll put that on my watch list because I did not care for Last Night in Soho, but that one sounds exponentially better. Yeah, I didn't so. mind Last Night in Soho. It was, it's fine. Yeah, that, that's how I felt. <laughs> I, I like Matt Smith's character. I thought it was cool. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so I also watched Gore, G-O-R. Gore! And it is a very tedious sword and sorcery movie. Oliver Reed's the bad guy in it. Jack Palance is in it. He's Jack Palance is also in the sequel, Outlaw of Gore, or something like that. I did sort of watch that. I watched the MST3K version of the sequel. Oh. So, but Oliver Reed is not in the sequel, which is kind of a spoiler for Gore, because if he's not in the sequel, that means he died. Oh. But there's a dummy drop in that one. That one's for Matt. Hell yeah. I put that in our dummy drop channel in our Discord for Matt. Uh, I also watched Sitting Target, which has um, Oliver Reed and Ian McShane breaking out of prison. 
it starts off with them in prison and Oliver Reed gets a visit from his wife who tells him that she wants a divorce because she's met someone else and she's pregnant. And so Oliver Reed is determined to break out of prison to kill her. Um, (laughs) It has a great prison breakout scene and Ian McShane's also really good in this. I I like it. You know, really great seventies peak Oliver Reed. I'll say that. Yes. Does Um, he have facial hair in this? He does not. Okay. Let's see. The Damned from 1962, Joseph Losey. I This is one that I had never gotten around to. I was I always would look at the poster and think, like, this is, like, Children of the Damned. Yeah, same. You know? Yeah, I've, I've, I have Damned. not seen it. It's Hammer, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. And so it feels like two movies in one. It starts out as this, like, juvenile delinquents, teens run amok, and then it turns into a sci-fi movie with radioactive kids. It's really messy, but it somehow kind of works because the movies are so different. You kind of get to in a twofer, I guess. Nice. Um, but Oliver Reed plays the leader of the gang and someone had posted, I think Adam watched this one too recently. And um, Henry had commented, he was like that every time someone mentions this movie, that fucking song gets stuck in my head. And it's like black leather, black leather. <laughs> Black leather, black leather, rock, rock, rock. Black leather, black leather, ta, ta, ta. Anyway, nice. it's so I, I warn you all, there is an earworm song in that in that film. Uh, I already mentioned I did watch Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll. That was actually a lot meaner than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we you mentioned that last uh, Horror Gives Back. Yeah, I loved that one. Yeah, that was really good. Then I watched Tomorrow Never Comes from 1978. Brian Sauer, former guest on our show, last Blu-ray wishlist episode, his review on Letterboxd had me sold on this. Um, he said it felt like a reverse ace in the hole. So I was like, boom, I'm sold. I love ace in the hole. So Oliver Reed is playing a police lieutenant. And it's his last day before he transfers back to his hometown because he's like, I've had enough of this city. You know, everything is here is corrupt and fucked up. And I hate it. I need a simpler police life or whatever. He ends up in a hostage negotiation situation at a hotel. This guy has... Uh, taken a woman hostage. It's his former girlfriend. And he goes back because he's heard like, oh, she's become a prostitute or something like that. So he's taken her hostage. So it's this cabana on the beach that's adjacent to a hotel. So they're having this huge hostage negotiation going on while the guests of the hotel are like watching from above like this whole <laughs> thing, like it becomes a whole thing. It was really neat. I really liked that one. So I definitely recommend Tomorrow Never Comes. Agree with Brian's review. Reverse Ace in the Hole. A couple more. Uh, Lady in the Car with Glasses and a Gun from 1970. This was just added to the White Slaves of Chinatown YouTube channel this week. So perfect timing for it. It stars, obviously, Oliver Reed and Samantha Egger. The Brood. Yes. Uh, so at first you think you're just watching a movie with Samantha Egger driving around France. Like I, I, I was like, what the fuck is, this? and I almost turned it off, but Lars had a review on letterbox that said, stick with it. It gets good. And I was like, okay, I'm going to trust Lars's review. And that's kind of literally what this movie is at first. Like it's just her driving around. She drops off her boss, which is Oliver Reed, uh, and his wife at the airport. And she's supposed to take their car back to their house in Paris but instead she misses a turnoff and just keeps driving and decides, you know what? I'm going to go down to the coast. I'm going to make a week. I got my boss's car, whatever. So the second half it get, is like what Lars's review said, because it gets, it gets kind of weird from there. Everywhere she stops, there is some trace of her previously being there, even though like she had just by mistake decided like on a whim decided, Oh, I'm going to go down to the coast instead of taking the car back. So the second half really like bakes your noodle. Oh, wow. And, but when it all comes together, you kind of want to immediately rewatch it and go back if you, to see if you missed any clues. So I'm not, that's all I'm going to say about it. Cause yeah. I went in blind with the exception of Lars's review that just said, stick with it. Yeah. That's, Those movies are the best when yeah. you want to immediately watch. So it, is, it has like a sci-fi element kind of. I, I'm not okay, spoiling. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. And I refuse to spoil anything. Wow. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm interested. All right, and then the last one, this one came from um, Brandon Vincent on in Instagram. He works at the um, Archivect, the, the Vinegar Syndrome yeah. store. He recommended on our IG question, uh, Oliver Reed performance, Skeleton Coast from 1988. Never heard of this film. 
He, the way he described it was like a trauma film, Man on a Mission with Ernest Borgnine, Oliver Reed, a bunch of other people in it. So Ernest Borgnine, he gathers a, a bunch of like army guys to go rescue his son who's been captured for some reason. Plot's not important, whatever. The movie's like, uh, the movie's not very good, but <laughs> <laughs> it is entertaining as hell most of the time. Oliver Reed is this unhinged bad guy who hunts down diamond smugglers. And there's a scene in there where he's got this guy handcuffed to a truck on the beach and the tide is coming in and he's like screaming at this guy he's like you made me kill the puppy i <laughs> fucking love animals it's the best thing i've ever seen in my life Yeah, that clip that was posted. Yeah. On I, I lost my shit on that. I was like, I have to watch this before the podcast, but I didn't get to it. Uh, but it also has Robert Vaughn in it, who yes, clearly did not get the memo that <laughs> this was a trauma movie and is given it his all. Uh, Herbert Lom is in this. Unrecognizable. I, I had to like go into credits and look and confirm it was him because he the drinking is not been kind to him oh and your other boy too sweet is in this oh shit yeah yeah leon kennedy uh -huh. yeah yeah um so skeleton coast the only play that, like this was not even being seated on my legal adjacent sites we love video they're not uh, like open yet for renting and i don't know if they have it yet because i can't check their like inventory inventory mm -hmm. not streaming anywhere except for amazon prime where it's for rent for six bucks um, oh, wow. So I did, I had Amazon credits, so I was like, fine, I'll spend that. And it was worth it because I got to see Oliver Reed yelling about how much he loves animals. So <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to check that out. Uh, did you watch any other Oliver Reed movies? Yeah, I yeah. I, I just focused on a few uh, like comedy movies that I'd never seen because again, I hadn't seen him in a lot of comedic roles. Uh, I watched one called Hannibal Brooks from 1969, directed by Michael Winner, who Oliver Reed worked with like on a bunch of his films, six films or so. Mm -hmm. It also it co-stars Michael Pollard. Do you remember him? I love him. Yeah, he's great. Uh, but Reed, he's just, he's an English soldier in World War II who's assigned to care for an elephant in a zoo. All these soldiers go to a zoo to kind of protect this zoo from being, you know, invaded, yeah. and you have to take care of the the animals. Uh, but it ends up getting bombed and destroyed. So he's then tasked to take the elephant to safety uh, to Switzerland. Oh. So he's it's like, like a, Operation Dumbo Drop. Yeah, he and he's ador <laughs> He's completely smitten with this elephant Aww. Lucy, and he's adorable. He's doing everything just to protect her. Polar's character just wants he just wants to kill Nazis all day. Oh yeah, which is fucking fun to watch. Yeah, and he does a great job. But he's like, you know, leave the elephant. Let's go. You know, <laughs> I can't leave the elephant. I'm in love with the elephant. <laughs> Um, <laughs> very strange tone though. It feels very family adventure. Like he said, like an operation, uh, Dumbo <laughs> drop, but there, it, it, it takes place in the war. So there's these dramatic dead bodies, you know, huh. friends, uh, soldiers being killed and showing their dead bodies with blood. It definitely has moments of war drama, but this one was really good. I think I watched this on prime. Okay. Uh, long dummy drop from a cable car, like really long. Ooh. Like you're like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, and then I watched another comedy called The Great Scout and Cat House Thursday. That's that's a title. Terrible title. Yeah. Uh, 1976. I really loved this comedy. This was the fa my favorite I've seen. Okay. Uh, even over Heckle and Hyde. Reed plays uh, Joe Knox. It's definitely not PC. He plays a half Indian, half white man. Ooh. Um, and he, he ba he's basically, if any Marvel Universe fans are out there, he's basically Drax from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay. And he has the clap. Okay. And he has a plan to sleep with as many white women, women as possible <laughs> to spread to the White House <laughs> and President Taft. <laughs> he, it is so hilarious. And he is so committed. I mean, he's always committed. But uh, in this, he's especially he's so captivating. Like every scene you want yeah. Joe Knox to pop up. But it's 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 a basic kind of western. It's about a group of guys wanting to collect their stolen gold, but co-starring Lee Marvin. Oh yeah, and Robert Culp. Oh, I love him. I got to see his penis recently. Yes, that's that's an emoji. <laughs> in our Culp penis. Uh, but yeah, it's directed by Don Taylor, who did Damien Omen Two and Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Okay. Uh, 
both are those are good decent movies, but sure. there there's again there's so many things wrong with this this comedy. But Marvin Reed Culp, they're not pulling any punches yeah. like to get a laugh. They're just going hard, and I I loved it. I probably rated it too low, but yeah. Okay. The Great Scout and Cat House Thursday. I forgot where I, that might have been two beer. I don't know. It was, it's it. streaming somewhere. Uh, I do recommend that. All right. Um, and then lastly, I had never seen Oliver all the way through. I same actually. I, I was thinking about it. I saw you watched it, and I was like, you know what? I've only ever seen like bits and pieces of it when it was on TV. Yeah, I, I know the story. You know, everybody sure. kind of knows the story. But I was like, I'm you know I'm going to watch it. Directed by Sir Carol Reed, who is Oliver Reed's uncle. He also, you know, directed The Third Man and right. Odd Man Out, good stuff. And Oliver won the, you know, the, and I wanted to see it too because, you know, it's, it, it won the Oscar for Best Picture, which beating out 2001, The Space Odyssey That's, that year. Jesus. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's see if this is better than Kubrick. Uh, it is not. But yeah, and, and Reed was in another Best Picture winner, uh, Ridley Scott's Gladiator, of course. He passed away during the filming of that. Yeah, he did. He yeah. Fucking out drinking some sailors in a bar. Like, that's, yeah, I mean, that's how the, Oliver should go out. Yeah, they <laughs> challenged him and he stepped up and he fucking died, <laughs> which is terrible. No, it's how someone who lives a life like that should go out. It's true. But I mean, you know, while doing this podcast, I did, you know, I, I watched a lot of fun, drunken interviews with Oliver Reed, yeah. which are all of them. Yeah, um, yeah. But then I started, you know, I started going down this this rabbit hole of watching, you know, interviews with Keith Moon, who he was very close with mm-hmm. uh, from The Who. Um, yeah. uh, Peter O'Toole, uh, Michael Caine, yeah. uh, Richard Harris, like all these people who drank and pr- they went just as hard as Oliver Reed. Yeah. And they lived to be like 90 years old. And I'm like, oh, Oliver, y- you went too hard. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I just wish he was still around, but. I mean, I. <laughs> Same. He obviously had a lot of politics and, and 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 ideas that I don't agree with. Oliver Reed. Sure, yeah, I I, I watched the Shelley Winters uh, Johnny oh, Carson yeah. episode <laughs> <laughs> interview where she poured a drink and he was just I don't know he was he was on a whole other level during that interview. Yeah, I but love yeah. him though. I love him so much. Like I don't care. Like as shitty as some of his opinions are, I don't no, care. I agree. No, I, I don't think, care. And. I, Physically, I think he's one of the most captivating looking men. Mm-hmm. And and I had read too that he was very self conscious of his body. He wasn't very happy with it. He was extremely shy, so that's why he drank to open up and become Oliver Reed. Right. But uh, I mean, and he was very worried about his scar that he got in a bar fight when he was twenty four, twenty five, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it was sixty four. And he was very worried about his career. Uh, but I think the car, the scar makes him so much more attractive. I, I don't know. He's a very good looking man. Hell he's, yeah. But the scar. Yeah. Let's go to the scar because he did so many films with Ken Russell and um, Ken Russell was the first director who hired him after his scar incident, after the bar fight incident. Yeah. Um, and that was for a movie that I did watch uh, a BBC TV movie called the Debussy film from 1965. Mm-hmm. He play, It's a biopic about a French composer, Claude Debussy. Apparently, Ken Russell had seen Reed in a Michael Winner film called The Girl Getters or The System, um, and he wanted to work with with Reed. So he reached out to Reed, and Reed said that this was crucial for his career because, like, again, not only was it the first time he found work with his scar, which he thought would ruin his career, um, but he got to meet Ken Russell. And obviously, he, he loved Ken Russell. He had said that um, – I had a quote here from him. It was something along the lines of, Hammer gave me my start, Hammer Films. Michael Winner gave me my bread. And Ken Russell came onto the scene and gave me my art. Mm-hmm. So he was very like, there were his most challenging roles, which he's, I, I, you know, he said in a lot of interviews. And they are. I mean, obviously the Devils. Uh, yeah. Of course, your favorite band, uh, from what I had seen, <sighs> The Who. He worked with Robert Daltrey. This is where he met Keith Moon, the, yeah. the, the drummer, who they were great drinking buddies and Got into a lot of fucking shenanigans, but Ken Russell directed uh, Liz Tomania and Tommy, mm-hmm. and Oliver Reed sings he does. a lot in Tommy, and he's he's a terrible singer. He, yeah, he's like Russell Crowe in Limits. Yeah, I would say Russell Crowe's better. Mm. So I went down the, uh, a little uh, rabbit hole about his singing, and I quickly found out that he had a musical career as a singer, like not associated with acting at all. This was early. I think it's, I'm always fascinated when I find out that actors have nothing to do with film. They just want to be 
yeah. a musical solo performer. <laughs> And he had some, uh, he released some singles on 45 in the early 60s. I'm probably going to close out one of the, use one of his songs. Is that an outro song? Yeah, Sick. that'll be an outro song. <laughs> one song is called The Wild One, which is what, there's there's a famous, uh, I mean, there's a lot of famous interviews from his talk show uh, appearances, but it's one where he's like wearing a blue shirt all untucked and he's like, oh, yeah, just yeah. hamming it up. Yeah. Uh, he's singing The Wild One from the 60s, his first single. That's what he, this is the song he was singing. All out of, you know, different lyrics and stuff, but Lonely for a Girl, a song called Sometimes. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's one called, I might pick one called uh, Ecstasy. I listen to these quite a bit, actually. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a, like a two minute song. They're very short. I listened to a two minute song called Ecstasy from 1962. And he's basically doing his best Elvis impression. Oh, oh like a little, come on, little girl, like just bad. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, it's so bad, but so good. And I had to point out, he did a Baby It's Cold Outside duet oh. with, uh, in 1962 with a, with a singer named Joyce Blair. I could barely get through it. It's atrocious. It is Ooh. terrible. No, I really can't stay. Wait, though, it's uh, cold out there. I've got to get away. But darling, it's cold outside. Tonight has been... I've been uh, hoping you drop in. Really? Yes, has seen it. Let's check it out. Everybody check out his, his music. And then real quickly, just to cover some more of his films, he did work with Hammer Films in the 60s a lot. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where he got his break. Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, that was his first Hammer, Hammer flick. Um, so he's in two Jekyll and Hyde adaptations. Yeah. There's another actor that, that is in Heckle and Hyde that also has two appearances. Tony Cox. He's the little, he's the little person, the black little person. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People know him, you know, from, uh, what do people know him from? Uh, I know him from Friday. Oh, from back from the bad Santa movies. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, he's Mr. Parker from Friday from ice cubes Friday. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he's also in a movie, in a movie called, um, heckle and hide together again, which I'm going to talk about here in a, a little later. Okay. Uh, but yeah, Curse of the Werewolf, Captain Clegg with Peter Cushing, the Pirates of uh, Blood River. Curse of the Werewolf was his first leading role for Oliver Reed. So we could go on and on about I Oliver know. Reed. I think I, kind of getting back to this being your pick, I, I, I was like, okay, it's going to be a fucking horror comedy. I go in with the expectation. I'm not going to like it. Probably. I didn't. <laughs> but at least... You know, it's one of the, it's one of those things that like, it's one of those opportunities for me to dig in, find some Oliver Reed movies that I haven't seen before. Cause you know, we're all about, you know, shining a light on things that, you know, don't normally get that. And so yeah. I, I had the opportunity to do that for this. So I'm, it's hard for me to put the word, to, to get the <laughs> words out and say, I'm happy that you picked this, but in a way I am, because had you not, I might never have watched some of these Oliver, Oliver Reed movies. I, I mean, I'll take it. I mean, okay. I, I, I appreciate you making an effort to find a good reason to watch Heckle and Hyde. Yeah. Or for, for, to find a good reason <laughs> to find a validating reason to wonder why I picked this movie. And uh, I don't know. I, I'll take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, because Heckle and Hyde. I mean, yeah. Well, let me let me run through the rest of this cast real quick, okay. it's real short, and then we're going to get into the movie. All Let's. Right. We're going to lay it out. Yeah, we're like forty minutes in here, and we're now getting into. The, <laughs> we haven't even got to the movie yet. <laughs> okay. So, um, of course, some of the characters in this film: uh, Dick Miller, we all know and love. Mel Wells plays Doctor Hinkle. He's the one who creates this uh, this paste. Um, he's very recognizable. He played Mushnik in Little Shop of Horrors. Mm -hmm. He's in a ton of Corman classics, Chopping Mall, Attack of the Crab, Monster, She-Beast. Uh, we also covered one of his movies. Um, he directed Lady Frankenstein, Mel yeah. Wells. Uh, Kedrick Wolf plays Dr. Lou Who. He pretty much popped up in every Charles B. Griffith movie I watched. He's like in Smokey, in the dust, Smokey Bites the Dust, Eat My Dust, Up from the Depths. Uh, he was in Forbidden Zone, uh, Richard Elfman's. Uh, and he remember that that stupid movie I watched, Disney's Mr. Boogity? Yeah. For like Horror Gets Back. He's in that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, 
Coral, Heckle's love interest. She's played by Sonny Johnson, who I really liked her in this. I liked actually all the uh, the women that pop up. I think they all were really funny. I think they delivered all their lines really well. I, I just liked all, all of the roles. And I did like Coral. Um, she only has a few uh, credits, Flashdance, Animal House, and a few other movies that uh, I'd never heard of. But she passed away just like a few years after shooting this in 1984, yeah. um, which is kind. Of, I think is really sad because I thought she was – you know, adorable in this role, super talented. Uh, we already talked about Tony Cox. Uh, he played Bad William in in Heckle and Hyde, uh, but he he's in Jekyll and Hyde together again. The funnier of the two Jekyll and Hyde comedies I've seen, okay, more so than like The Nutty Professor and stuff, okay. even. <laughs> um, and then uh, real quick, Lieutenant Mac Druck uh, or El Topo. He, he plays he's Virgil Fry plays him, um, and he's a cop in. Pretty much everything he's in. He's he in, looks like that, though. You know, he's got he that look. totally has that look. He's a cop in Dennis Hopper's Colors and Dennis Hopper's The Hot Spot. Uh, he's a cop in Revenge of the Ninja. He's a cop in Graduation oh, Day. Okay. He's, I mean, he's got that white guy sheriff look. Uh, and then uh, Jackie Coogan plays a deputy. And Coogan is best known as playing the kid from Charlie Chaplin's The Kid. Mm-hmm. He's the young kid. Also, I know you can't really see it. The quality of Heckle and Hyde on YouTube isn't very good, but the hospital is called the Robert A. Coogan Memorial Clinic. And uh, that was kind of like a shout out to Jackie Coogan's brother who had passed away a year before they started shooting. Uh, but yeah, a lot of recognizable actors. Um, that's what I got for cast and crew. Let's talk about Heckle and Hyde. All right. We'll do that right after. We're going to spend like, what, five minutes talking about this movie after this break? It'll be quick. <laughs> You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Okay. Uh, first off, I understand that a lot of people probably won't enjoy this movie. You know, you're you're included. Yeah. Um, I but like you said, I I had reasons to make this pick. Oliver Reed was a, pretty much the main reason. Sure. But again, we want to shed light on movies that people have never seen. That's kind of what we do. Yeah. I'll give you. I like I said earlier. I don't hate this movie. I I I got through it, and I was just like. I'm not mad that I watched it. I watched another Oliver Reed movie. Yeah. I have some nice things to say about it. Um, I mentioned a couple of them already though. So like the colorful sort of dream sequences in the end with the police, like the, the final death scene at the end when it's like, the, there's a bunch of different ape masks for some reason. Yes. The, I, I loved that <laughs> at the, I mean, there's no sense in it, but no. it, it does. It's a callback. It shows every, um, pretty much every character from the movie. And then they start throwing in like alien masks yeah. and like gorillas and just weird random people. Yeah. Like, like heckle, no, sorry. Hype and heckle. They're the same person are dying. Yeah. And yeah, it's every, it, it, his face turns into every character in the movie. And then all of a sudden it's like alien mask, ape mask, melted ape <laughs> mask. Uh, chimpanzee mat. Like, what is happening? This movie makes no sense. And then he turns into kidneys. Yeah. And then he disappears. Yeah. If you're not already following us on, that's the end of the episode. If you're not following us on uh, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I jumped right to the end, but no, I no. don't have very many things that I like about this movie. So. Well, I got about eight pages here. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I did like the, the deaths in it. You know, there's a, there's some good kills. There's a, an, a lamp electrocution. And I think somebody had commented that they did chuckle at this line that he said after he killed her, she's dead and I'm still a virgin. She's dead and I'm still a virgin. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot I like about this, but I, a couple nights ago, I was in the shower really thinking about Heckle and Hyde. Um, you what? guys get this vision in your head right now, All okay? Right. I'm singing. I'm 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 lathered. <laughs> and then I thought, 
This movie is like a roach on its back. Okay, it's ugly. It's really like has these spits of these fits of sporadic energy. It's flailing to get right, mm-hmm. but it's it's pretty much dead. Like it's dead and it, it's not going anywhere. So it's a roach. Heckle and Hyde is a, it's, and it's something that pretty much everyone on the planet hates. Yeah, I mean, I hate roaches. Yeah, but I'll watch it because I want to watch them die. Oh, okay. Also, the roach is probably screaming, and it's like you can't hear roaches scream, God, so you can't ugh. hear it very well. You can't hear Heckle and Hyde. The audio is terrible. No, the audio is <laughs> terrible on this version. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 messy, and like I said, it from the moment Griffith started writing this movie. To the moment, moment he f- turned it in, it was only nine weeks. Like that's, that's less than that's. That, let's let's just say it's two months. That's commendable. <laughs> like yeah, it's commendable. Because uh, yeah, it, it didn't get a theater release. Um, they sold it straight to cable, uh, Canon Group, and Elvira showed it on her movie Macabre in, uh. in the late eighties. I rewatched it this morning, uh-huh. and I, I watched the Elvira show, uh, the Elvira's movie Macabre version. It's on like was it on archive. TV? Oh, it's or, on archive. Okay. But uh, yeah, her little in between segments, all she does is make like foot jokes. Like yeah. he's such a heel. Ha ha ha. Uh, That's but yeah. cute. Uh, but yeah, I did want to go over like I, I already mentioned it, but just a lot of people, a lot of actors that have played Jekyll and Hyde. Mm-hmm. Oliver Reed, obviously, Boris Karloff uh, did it. Kirk Douglas, Christopher Lee, and I Monster, Michael Caine, uh, Bernie Casey. Yeah. Uh, John Malkovich and Mary Riley, Spencer Tracy, Anthony Perkins, and Edge of Sanity. Of course, John Barrymore's 1920, which I watched, uh, the silent movie, which was, was it's good. David Hasselhoff has the 2001 musical, Jekyll and Hyde. Oh. Yeah. I, I kind of want to watch that. Uh, I already mentioned Tony Todd uh, in Beekler's version. Uh, Jack Taylor in 1972 plays Jekyll and Hyde versus Paul Nashie, the werewolf. That's Klamowski. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Jerry Lewis. Um, Jack Palance played one, uh, and I watched his movie, the strange, I think it was the strange case of, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It, it's on Tubi. It's a stagey TV production from Dan Curtis. Yeah. Very talky. I loved it. I think it's really great. It reminded me a bit of Louis Jordan's, uh, Count Dracula. Okay. I can see Palance doing a great Jekyll. And I think, he, I think he's the best I've seen. Like oh. I, I saw, I haven't seen Mary Riley. And when I visually, when I'm thinking of Jekyll and Hyde characters and I started going through this list, I made the list because I was like, Jack Palance is the best Jekyll and Hyde ever. Who else played it? Yeah. And then I saw, Oh, John Malkovich played him. That could work. I saw, I remember I saw Mary Riley when it came out in theater and I don't remember. I mean, but I was also a kid when it came out. Cause it's what early nineties. Yeah. Think. I think, yeah. 96 maybe. Oh, okay. I was in high school, but, uh, but yeah, he, it's almost like, almost like two Jekylls when you think of John Malkovich. Yeah. Like it's not, I was thinking like, cause Jack Palance, First off, his makeup looks like when he turns into Jekyll in yeah. this in this TV production, it looks like Bruce Campbell from Escape from L.A. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it, he is a terrifying Jekyll, and Palance sells it like he's great. And then I thought, how cool would it be? I mean, obviously the dual roles for a single actor is really fun, but how cool would it have been if, like, for that Dan Curtis production, like Louis Jordan plays uh, Doctor Jekyll mm. and. Uh, what uh, Jack Palance plays is Hyde. Oh, like that would be okay. a cool flip. But anyway, and then I watched uh, Jekyll and Hyde together again, which was the comedy I talked about with Tony Cox also appearing. I recommend this. I think it was on YouTube. Uh, it's a Lawrence Gordon production. He did Die Hard, Predator, Streets of Fire, The Warriors. Oh yeah. Uh, but Mark Blankfield uh, plays uh, Jekyll and Hyde, um, and it's it's slapstick straight through mm. but it's a it it's more like an airplane or like a christopher get like it okay it's funny i found it funny and it's a musical mm-hmm. there's original songs throughout okay but what's funny is uh he snorts he does cocaine he, he snorts the drug oh yeah and he turns into a disco cokehead like <laughs> sex maniac <laughs> or his letterbox puts it he turns into this is on the summary an obnoxious southern californian <laughs> Oh, rude. But anyway, his, his, his chest gets real hairy. Gold okay. chains burst out under his skin. Okay. His pinky nail gets long. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good practical effects. A pinky ring like splits open out of his uh, pinky. And it's oh, like okay. he just a sleazy mustache pops out. His butt, his dick gets bigger. It's a lot of fun. 
Um, and it ends with literally kind of Heckle and Hyde had something in the very beginning that said something like with apologies to Robert Louis yeah, Stevenson. Did, yeah. Uh, this one ends with literally a really cool shot of a cemetery. It goes down into the uh, coffin underground, uh-huh. kind of like kind of like our unsung oh, horrors Stevenson logo. Stevenson rolling in his grave. Literally rolling in his grave. There you go. There you go. Good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of cameos in that too. Elvira is in it. Yeah. Lynn Shea plays a horny uh, nurse. Uh, George Went played a patient. So yeah, and then of course Tony Cox. So Tony Cox and Oliver Reed have something in common, both being in two Jekyll. And there Hyde. you go. Uh, but yeah, anyway, Heckle and Hyde, uh, like I said, I feel like it's it's a mad mag- it's a cartoon come to life. It's a mad magazine comic strip come to life for me. Um, it's just so absurd. One thing that I I, I did I kind of wish it went further because uh, Heckle is such a monster. Like, and people people are kind of just dis- outside of the medical clinic. People are kind of grossed out by him, but yeah. they just look at him like as a normal person walking around. So I kind of wish they played more on like a a Dick Tracy type vibe where there's these other weird looking guys walking around. Yeah. But I did like what they did with the environment, with the lighting and stuff. Yeah. Um, again, stuff I loved was his inner dialogue to me. They're the funniest moments. I love the whole setup where he's just talking to himself. When Coral first comes into his office, he's like, why did she come here to torment me? I just like to watch her get on the bus every morning. I don't want to know her name or her dress or anything. And then he looks up and he asks, he's all, did you leave your address? <laughs> you know, asking for a dress, super, super funny. Like, and she says, Oh, my feet are in your hands, doctor. And he thinks this, my heart is in your feet. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's not. Oh my God. I, I mean, I have so many quotes here. I'm not going to go down because obviously don't. it's not going to work. No, but yeah. literally the only line I semi chuckled at was the same one that someone mentioned already it was the, she's dead. And, and I'm, I'm still, still a virgin. virgin. And I was like, huh. No, and that we're, was we're, my end of it. Before he kills one of the the ladies, uh, I think it's when the oh the smash in the mirror. Yeah, one? yeah. He rips his shirt open. Yeah, and he's like, "Look at this body!" And he like forces her to look in the mirror. He's grabbing her head, and he's all, "Who's the grooviest of all?" Like he, he wants these women to tell him that he's the most beautiful person in the room in the world. Yeah, and I could see Oliver Reed doing that, like in a drunken fit. Like, look at me, I'm Oliver Reed. Like, yeah, I'm gonna kill you if you don't tell me. I don't know. Dick Miller. <laughs> Dick who, Miller. Yeah. Yeah. He kind of reprises his role in Joe Dante's The Burbs yeah. later. He plays the garbage man, which is, is great. It's cute. Oh, uh, genius. Not acupuncture, not acupressure, but acutickle. Come on. You can't. Okay. That's terrible. I mean, I, I didn't think that was funny at all. No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, seriously. This movie is easily, it should have been edited down. I rated it higher than it should. Yeah. Way higher on Letterboxd than what, you know, the few people, a few hundred people have seen. But yeah, it's not, I mean, Charles B. Griffith movies, it, it's, they're not politically correct, the no. humor. And this one, is, I think Smokey Bites the Dust or might, might be the worst of them. Okay. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes. There's a lot of uh, just vulgar humor, um, a lot of boob jokes, a lot of weight jokes, you know, slapping women on the behind. And, but we we always cover products of of, of the time, right? This yeah. is you know going into a new century or a new decade of nineteen eighty of cocaine's just rampant, and yeah. Men are fucking scum and <laughs> still are, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm. I, I think it's stupid. I think the dialogue is so. I, I do think the pacing is kind of fast uh, as far as the dialogue goes. It doesn't give you time to think of about how stupid these lines are that they're saying. Yeah. But when you take a step back, personally for me, while I'm in the shower and thinking about it, oh, it makes me laugh. These, these moments of Oliver Reed losing his mind because he wants people to yell and scream how handsome and beautiful he is. Oliver Reed, you are a handsome devil. There we go. There. I mean, th- I'm sure there are other people out there who think that this is funny. This does not work at all for me. I think it doesn't work for 99% of the population, but you know, Lance, you're in that, you're in that special 1%. And yeah. I love you for being a champion of a movie like this. Thank you. I don't ever want to watch it again. I'm I, glad that I got to watch some other Oliver Reed movies though. Yeah. What would you, uh, you know, obviously you're going to watch this movie or end this movie. You, you feel like the, the crowd's going to hate it. What yeah. would you pair with this? So initially I was thinking doing another sort of 
a typical adaptation of Stevenson's story. Um, I did watch, you mentioned one of the other actors who played Jekyll and Hyde was um, Bernie Casey, who yes. played uh, Dr. Black. Yeah, it's in Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. I really liked that one. I, I hadn't seen it before. Same director as Blackula, William Crane. So check that one out. But I it's, instead went for, you know, this this episode's all about Oliver Reed. So I went for another Oliver Reed movie, specifically him in an adaptation of a gothic classic. So uh, The House of Usher from 1989. This has a Vinegar Syndrome release. Uh, Reed plays Roderick Usher. And I am just going to read Justin Low Liberty's review of this. Uh, he works at uh, Vinegar Syndrome OCN. He said, it's obviously not the best adaptation of its source, but it's the only one that I know of to feature Oliver Reed ordering a man's dick to be eaten by a hungry rat. So that makes it worth a watch at the very least. That does make it worth a watch. Mm -hmm, 100%. Uh, so yeah, House of Usher 1989 is my double feature. What about you? Yeah, I'm going with another Oliver Reed, Oliver Reed in dual ro roles, hamming it up in monster makeup. So I'm going with Hammer's The Curse of the Werewolf from 1961. Nice. This is his first lead role, directed by Terrence Fisher. Yeah, he was 22 at the time. And werewolf films typically involve a man who are, you know, very much tormented with their inner conflict. Kind of very Jekyll and Hyde yeah. type of situation, which, you know, is kind of Curse of the Werewolf. I don't need to get into the plot. It's just a gothic werewolf story. I, I did read in... Uh, in, an auth in the authorized uh, Terrence Fisher biography, that mm -hmm. book that you got me, The Monster Gothic Cinema yeah. by Tony Dalton, um, the great makeup artist, Roy Ashton, who did makeup for some of the best horror films, Curse of the Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Gorgon, a bunch of the Christopher, Christopher Lee Draculas. Uh, he said that, quote, I think that my best makeup was the werewolf with Oliver Reed. It was the most reward rewarding and one of the most difficult to do. Huh. So... Again, the I, I kind of want to balance out the bad makeup in Heckle and Hyde, throw out some really pro stuff and in, 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 uh, this Hammer stuff. Play, Watch Oliver Reed play a man slash werewolf and then an older Reed play a man slash monster podiatrist. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what about the next pick? All right, next pick. We're getting away from this. So, um, Oh, come on. Next episode is actually going to be our June exploitation wrap up episode. So folks have plenty of time to get to this next movie, which you might need because it's a long one. Oh, and we're actually going to be covering a movie from a country that we have not covered before. Um, and for those who are not keeping track, that in includes me because I literally put this list together before recording. Uh, we have covered horror films produced in 14 different countries. So oh, far. nice. Yeah. So we've done U.S., obviously, uh, U.K., Spain, uh, Italy, Hong Kong, South Korea, Sweden, Denmark, Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, Canada, France, and Latvia. So now it's going to be 15. Oh, I'm excited. What is it? This is also the 69th movie that we've covered, folks. Nice. But it's not horny. Sorry. God damn it, Erica. I know. I, know. I had one fucking... I had one chance to <laughs> get us a horny movie for number 69. 68 was the horny movie. <laughs> Heckle and I. Okay. No. So, Mondo Macabro recently put out a box set of Ramsey Brother horror movies. Uh, so, we are going to be covering one of the films from that set. The Bollywood horror movie, Piranha Mandir from 1984. Uh, so, this film starts with a... Village killing the bloodthirsty monster Sam Ree. Move, they remove his head from his body and they bury them separately. But before he is killed, he places a curse on the villagers and their descendants, which affects the family that we are going to be following in present day when some nosy teenagers bring Sam Ree back to life and they must find a way to destroy him. Now, I complained earlier about musicals. Um, but we are covering a Bollywood movie, and that means there's going to be some songs in there. Fuck yes. Um, I understand that these films are not for everyone. They're generally over two hours long. This one uh, that we're going to be covering is two hours and 24 minutes. You know, it has multiple songs that to a Western audience are out of place, um, and the movie spend a lot of time talking through the drama. Um, but we're going to talk about all those elements and how they are part of these types of films as well as give a very, very generalized overview of Indian cinema because uh, Indian cinema is massive. And I think a lot of people think 
all Indian films are Bollywood. And that is very much not the case. Right. We'll dive into that. I am calling in some help for this one because I cannot do this alone. Uh, so Josh Hurtado is going to be joining us. He is a film writer for Austin Chronicle, Screen Anarchy, and a few other sites, as well as the founder of Potentate Films, which helped to promote the Tollywood film RRR yeah. here in the States. So chances are, if you're on Twitter, if you saw anything posted about RRR, that was Josh retweeting that. So Yeah, and when it won the uh, Academy Award for Best Original Song, yeah. I was like, I immediately thought of Josh. Yeah, he so. was so excited for that. So he's going to be joining us to talk about our first Indian horror movie, Piranha Mandir. If you've got the Mondo Macabro box set, you're well prepared for our next episode. you got plenty of time to watch that film and maybe a couple others from that set. Unfortunately, I could not find it streaming anywhere with English subtitles. So if I find one, I'll put a link in show notes somewhere. But uh, for now, it might be just a little bit limited in the watching, but not it's going to be an informative episode, whether you've seen it or not. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and really like, yes, we spoil films, but we're going to be talking about a lot of other stuff having to do with Indian cinema and Bollywood, et cetera, and the Ramsey brothers. So that is going to be mid July. So again, our next episode is our June exploitation recap. Then we'll get into Ramsey brothers, Piranha Man Deer from 1984. If you are not already, you can follow our podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Unsung Horrors. Check our link tree f- for a link to join our Discord. Uh, you can follow me on Letterboxd, Instagram, and Twitter at Hex Massacre. I'm on Letterboxd and Instagram under El Shibe. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and hope everyone enjoys the rest of their June. We'll see you back in two weeks for our June exploitation wrap-up. Bye. Bye. Magic kisses holding you like this in ecstasy. Ecstasy. The love that you have given makes his life I'm living ecstasy. Ecstasy. Never let me go. Let the love I show. Uh, take me by the hand and lead me to the land of ecstasy. Ecstasy. From the first time that I saw you, you showed me. It's Death by Video. I'm Phil. I'm Kit. And I'm Graham saying welcome to our podcast full of merry movie mayhem. Ever wonder what an Irish kung fu movie would look like? It's called Fatal Deviation, and we covered it. Ever wonder what a movie about a thousand cats would look like? It's called Night of a Thousand Cats, and we covered it. And it stars Hugo Stiglitz. Listen to Death by Video to hear us discuss and dissect some of the weirdest, wildest, and wackiest films ever made. All this and more on Death by Video! Woo!